Welcome to League Legends on Fox Sports, where we travel through the long and colourful history of rugby league as companions of those who made it all happen. Our guest this time was named Hooker in the ARL Team of the Century, and it must be said that he saw a good proportion of rugby league's first hundred years. He was the first hooker forward to make three kangaroo tours and played 28 tests in a time when 10 was a fair career. He's been a boxer, a butcher, a soldier and a TV star. In fact, he's done so much it's almost hard to know where to begin with Noel Kelly. Gee, I've talked you up, haven't I? This better be a good interview. Yeah, you've gone for a tip. <laughs> Ned, you first played for Queensland and Australia in 1959 and for a lot of your career, the game was unlimited tackle and you were in each other's faces right across the field. What was it like to play? It was, it was a bloody tough game, Tim, you know, and that's how it, everybody expected it to be tough. Like, you'd go on and no replacements and, you know, you might have one reserve and all this stuff and say, so you had to stay there. Your nose could be all over your face or your eye cut or, you know, and there's Blokes played in tests uh, with broken arms, Alan Prescott and those kind of they, they you know, couldn't go off the field, so it was a rugged game. But while you're playing it and your body's hot and you're excited and you're, you're going for it, you don't feel a thing. It's as good as gold. You know? So if you could inflict a bit of damage on the other team, oh, yeah. Ed, that would go a long way towards... It was all about that. The first thing they taught you when you were a front rower, don't let him get over the top here. You know, you had to get in there and battle it out this right from the all the coaches used to as kids, you know. Yeah. And of course, there's the other thing, you know, we never had coaches like they have today. You know, I'm not comparing the game, but we never had coaches like they have today. We, like I said before, you might be sixteen to seventeen being coached by a lad, but he'd be the captain's father, you know, never played or somebody he thought he could play, you know, and the, all that sort of stuff. So that's how it was. And when I went away in the 59 Kangaroos, when I came back, I'd only been coached by Dan Dempsey, really, uh, three or four times. And um, the fact that I'd been away in a kangaroo tour, everybody thinks, that, oh, geez, you'll make a good coach this plug and you pull you straight out of the ranks and put you on the field and all of a sudden you're a captain coach. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it had its ups and downs. But it, it was a tough game, mate. It was rugged. But everybody played it in, in in that area. There was no laying down if you were, weren't hurt or anything like this. If you were laying down, you were, uh, you you were hurt. You were hurt, yeah. 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 Ned, what was the first scrum like in a, in a game generally? Well, see, there's another side to it. In Referees used to let you go for the first 10, 15 minutes, you know. Like, you would go to, uh, uh, say we're playing palms at the cricket ground, you know. Everybody that's walking in the place has got a stern look on their face, you know, and of course we're all revved up and ready ready to go out and do battle and the bombs are all the same, you know, they're all, they hated us as much as we hated them. So um, uh, when, when you're on your way out, you sort of couldn't get anyone's eye, all you want to do is get out there and get into it, you know. Well, most times the referee would say, You've got 10 minutes, right? <laughs> <laughs> 10 minutes of mayhem. You let it go for it. Yeah, yeah. go for it. Yeah. But once the 10 minutes over, you're off of any of your nonsense, you know? And there was one coach, you know, one referee who, who would see someone give you one in the back play, you know? And he'll say, you only got one shot to get square. As he went by, so he'd let you square up with the guy that gave it to you, you know, the late tackle. But there was never... There was never a lot of this cheap shot and stuff like that in those days. And uh, all this is you know, talk and bagging one another. None of that either. You know, there was not... Everybody respected everybody for what they were, really, you know. Given your background, though, they'd respect you a bit more. Give, you know, you'd been through the tents and everything and learned how to fight. You yeah. could hold them up. Oh, yeah, I could, yeah, but I, yeah, but you're right about that, Tim, but there was... A, it was a mutual respect, you know, like Kevin Ryan. Kevin Ryan, had had, he was a Queen Bank champion or something. He had a few fights and that, and I, everybody respected Kevin. But Kevin's twice my size, you know. They, they sort of look, look at me after. People think when you're out on the field that you're an absolute monster, you know, like, a, you know, but when you dress down in your clothes and you, you walk out of the place and, and um, 
it's a different story, you know. They look at you and say, Jesus, you've got to be kidding, you know. <laughs> but uh, that's how it was. You know? yeah. Like we were walking in the ground one day, my wife and I, Chris, we are walking in and uh, this kid's walking in with his dad and the, and the kid's saying, that's Noel Kelly, that's Noel Kelly, you know. And his father said, come on, he's not half the size of him, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to give the old man the nod. To that's me. Get him on side, yeah. Get to get him out of trouble with his son. But, I mean, that's how it was. You know. Ned, do you know how many times you were sent off? Yeah, I was 17. But, see, there was uh, Tim. I know I've said this a thousand times. Referees didn't just understand me. But that, that was only a, that was only a way of just there are, putting it, I'd yeah. say. But a lot, the times that... See, when you're a hooker, right, you got, the, the rule says that you've got to both your arms over the top. You know. So well, don't forget, well, when, when you haven't got the loose head, you know, which means that you're, you've got the, the, hook, the other hooker's head's here, so how the hell are you supposed to see the ball coming in? So you have to drop a loose arm. And you go, and that's where all the trouble starts. So, as soon as you drop a loose arm, the bloke over there lets one go and all this while. And, of course, the forms were specialists at it. They, they'd walk to the referee as the scrum's going down there and say, hey, get his arms up and all this stuff, you know. He got loose arm and all this, you know. And the referee said, get your arm over the top. If you put your arm over the top, down the belt hell out of you, you know. So the, uh, the only, only way you could... Um, only way you could square up that is... Grab a jumper or something of the the one that came through and just hang onto it until everything is settled and yeah and get his number you know and now I got caught a lot of times like squaring it up because you can't square them up in there if you're all gone. you know you you got both your arms over your head so you say, <laughs> out in the open and have to and I, I my I had no brains I had a short fuse you know as soon as I get near I give it to him you know so. <laughs> it's all good now. How different was it then, Ned, to be a hooker in the game of rugby league? Explain, Tim. You can't the believe the evolution it. of it. Like in this generation of people coming through watching rugby league, it's hard to believe. But a lot of them don't even know what a scrum is. You know, with what you see today, it's just getting people out of the road. You know, or anybody goes there. But in uh, in our day, there was a front row a prop on the open side. There was a hooker on the blind side of prop and they all had a job to do, as well as the second rowers had a job to do, as did the lock and the half. And, of course, uh, the hooker in those days, mate, was was his job to get the, the ball. He was the bloke that got dropped if we didn't win the scrums. And you, and there was a big saying, you know, they, if you, you've got to have the ball to win, you know, score try. So there were many battles in there that no-one knows anything about. It was wild and woolly, but... It was fantastic to play the game as a hooker because you had a uh, um, a battle going with, with the other hooker and the other props, you know, and everybody's pulling you back out of the thing and giving you biff and all this, you're lying down with a loose arm and the you know, hookers were all known cheats. We're like, they called us cheats, but you have to, had to do things. We had to get the ball out with our feet and the halfbacks were cheating, putting it in with the with their hands, so it makes it a bit different, you know. But you wanted to run with the ball, though, too, yeah. didn't you? And they yeah, normally didn't do that much? No, well, it was a long... You're right there, Tim. It was, a, it was an era just on its way out of the, the hooker being the bloke who just walked from scrum to scrum. And uh, he he didn't, doesn't, didn't play the part anywhere but to look after the middle is and win the ball, of course, you know. Well... Uh, when Ian Walsh and I, I was a Queensland hooker in that year, and Ian Walsh came with the New South Wales side, and we um, we beat New South Wales for the first time for, for 100 years. It's reversed to what it is now. And the only uh, New South Wales used to match us up, you know. So uh, in our very first year, we won the Bulimba Cup, the same front row, and Jimmy Patterson and Elton Rasmussen, Joey Baker, they... Uh, we, uh, made the uh, Queensland side and beat New South Wales. We The, uh, the uh, Kiwis were here and uh, we beat them in the series, then the three tests, and then the, the three of us plus and the five of us 
found ourselves on the kangaroo trip all in one year. Mm. And of course, that that's how it happened to me. I, like I said to you before, I was never born to be a, a great footballer or anything, but it just, it all happened and, and just changed my life around. And and in the meantime, I'd, I'd met my beautiful wife, you know, and we, we got married and all that sort of stuff. And when you went to West's, it wasn't straightforward, was it? You went more or less via the boxing tent again. Oh, yeah, yeah. Tell well, that story. Well, Jimmy Sharman, who was uh, the boss of Jimmy Sharman's and, and his dad, of course, with, this was Jimmy Sharman Jr. Jimmy used to play for Wes. And now when, when I came back off the kangaroo trip in 1959, I got a, a, a job at air for a year as captain coach. When I went up, I signed as captain coach and then when I got there, they said, now we want to have a talk to you. Well, I got six teams and we want the, the uh, secretary of each team to uh, have a talk to you and, you know, and make sure they're all happy with it and how you going. And I said, oh, that'll be good. And, the, and I said, why, why the, all the secretaries, do I have the front, there's all the secretary? They said, well, what it is, you have to play with a different side every week. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> And I said, oh, Jesus, what about in a, in a, in a grand final? <laughs> he said, you play? don't have to play in a grand final. I said, well, I won't win, will I, you know. So anyway, it was good. We, we got over it all right, but it was a bit rugged. Like I'd play with Colts this week and against Hornets and then next week I'd play for Hornets against Colts, you know. <laughs> You'd have to make sure you got on with everyone, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, it was good. We had a lot of Islander lads here who used to come down. We used to sing the smile and watermelon over a barbecue of a night time, you know. How much were you paid? 800 quid a house and a job. That so must have been pretty good. Eight, that was max. You couldn't get any more than that. That's a big hand. No ad breaks during play. Don't miss a thing. Big hit! What a shot that is! That is an absolute I've got to be free. I've got to be free. Daring to try to see when or die. I've got to be me. Shop at Chemist Warehouse and stop paying too much for big brand fragrances. Get Calvin Klein Euphoria for women 100ml, 49.99, Or Calvin Klein CK1 200ml, just 34.99. Shop in-store, online or click and collect from our house to yours. Switch on a Dakin Alira X split system with advanced streamer technology to remove more than 99% of harmful indoor air pollutants and surround yourself with cleaner air this summer. Dakin, perfecting the air. What a wonderful day All the luck in the world for me That's the way I do it Nothing to it Wonderful day Before a world of heroes and villains One power ruled it all Black Adam Heroes don't kill people Well, I do Express release available now in Foxtel Store In 1963, West played a third straight grand final against St George and that one was made famous, of course, by John O'Grady's photo that became the NRL trophy. But it was infamous for another reason, because Darcy Lawler had the whistle and you knew you couldn't win. Gibbo, of course, you knew. Jack was a well, well and truly into the, into the betting business in, you know, SP and all that sort of stuff. And he, he came to uh, the game and chucked his bag down beside mine. And he used to call me Snoz. And he said, we can't win, Snoz. I said, what do you mean, can't win? Pig's ass, we can't win. You know, I, was, you know, I couldn't believe he'd say that. So he said, we can't win. He said, I know the bloke has got his money. He's backed them. I said, you kid. Anyway, cut a long story short, I said to him, oh, Christ, go and tell 
who will believe it, I tell me, you know. So we were talking about it. And anyway, I talked to her. And I, I met the guy who put the money on after the game. You know, well, that's Tuesday. a massive story, isn't it? It's yeah. an almost... Yeah, it happened. A, and uh, this, you ask any hooker that was playing in that era or any of those forwards that, about the business, about if he called you by your Christian name or, or by your number, you knew whether you were on or not, you know. And half the time you were see you later. Second scrum in the, in the second half, you were gone. Yeah. It's just, uh, just unbelievable that it could happen in the game, but it did. You know, I'm not sitting here making up stories, you know. Like, I mean, I there was one game we... We were playing, uh, I think we were playing para at the cricket ground. And uh, I was going for it. It was a good day. I was having a, but I was handing a bit out. I was getting a bit too, but I was handing a bit out. Of the way. But he kept pulling me out for repeated scrum infringements. And when we came in, I said to Bill Beaver, you may as well keep the hot water running, Bill. So the second scrum will be back in there. And he said, what do you mean? I said, he'll send me off in the second scrum this place. So Dennis Mooney was the prop, and I said to Dennis, under no circumstances, let me get offside or lighter. I've got to get in behind your feet, you know. Stay out, blah, blah, blah. We talk, tell him what, what I wanted, what, what he had to do. So we go out the second scrum, we stood out, the ball come in the scrum, no one moved. And the next minute I was having a shower. <laughs> yeah. So it happened, I, as a matter of what happens, or, there's nothing you can do to change the story. It was a true one. You know. Did you let the fact that you'd had that grand final taken away from you, did that dwell on you? Hurts, did, yeah, it yeah. still does. Mm. Only where, where it hurts is this, that you see blokes and they're good players, great players, and, they, and, they, and they can always say they played in the wind. And they always get wrapped as playing in a premiership team, you know. And that we got kicked out of it. You know, we never... And never had a, game, a chance to win it. And that was the one year we could Because we'd beaten them three times mm. in a row, you know. And uh, anyway, that's life. Ned, you've turned 80. You were born in Goodner in Queensland and started rugby league and boxing at about 11 or 12. But there was something about the Christian brothers when you went to school that just didn't work. What was it? Uh, they didn't understand me and I didn't understand them. I didn't last too long there. I, I was there for a couple of years, but we, I found the brothers to be a bit violent, you know, and we used to put the old strap over you a bit often, so I let the old inkwell go one day and ran out of the place. That was it in the end of that. And then uh, I kept wagging it until I was 14 and uh, got a job. So uh, I was always the kid that was the, the ice man and the milkman and the baker. Everybody had a horse and cart to to deliver their goodies in, so there was always a job. You could always get two bob or three bob yeah. to do something. And when, again, what about rugby league at that point in your life? It was about that stage, about when I was 14, 13 or 14, I uh, liked to play rugby league and then I was playing with Goodner and then as I was growing up, I, I also uh, participated in boxing a lot. I, I love boxing and, and then... Uh, I used to go to a gym in Oxley. It was again. That was a seven-mile trip in the, in the train. Go down to Dick, Dick Gunthorpe's uh, gym at at uh, Oxley, and he'd, we'd train down there. And then he'd about four or five of us. He would take to the different bouts in different uh, countries, places, you know. So we had plenty of fights there, and that was all good. I loved that. Uh, that that all, and, and luckily I did because I, I was able to hold my hands up all. When I did break into the big time, you know. But Tim, I was never ever born to be a a rugby league star or a rugby league Australian representative. It was it was just part of I always worked hard, so I probably worked hard on the uh, on the field as well, you know. Mm. And uh, when when we uh, we I think we won a couple of junior uh, competitions in Goodna, but when I got to about seventeen, I think it was, uh, I had to go to Ipswich to play. And then um, because they had senior grade, you know. And I went to Ipswich and I played for a year with railways. And then Gary Parcell um, and his brother were playing at the Brothers Club. So I'd been to the Brothers School. So I, and Dan Dempsey was the coach of Ipswich Brothers. So I went to Brothers. 
and um, played there for a couple of years. But, but And it was there that uh, Dud Beatty from Railways, Gary Parcell and I from Brothers uh, formed uh, the front row of the Ipswich Belimba Cup side. You played a lot of football with the great Harry Wells. How good was he? Jesus, there's no better player than Harry Wells, I could tell you. That's, Harry a big, Wells, that's a big call, no? Oh, he had these big thighs. I mean, Reggie was a great player. Reggie has you know, different type to Harry. But because it, Harry sort of mentored Gaz, didn't yeah. he? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and Harry could handle it and he, he could play. He, in big leagues, I mean, geez, I saw a short on him again the other night and just realised how good he really was, you know. He was a wonderful player. You spent your last years at Wests as captain coach and they called the team Kelly's Kids. What was that like? Wonderful, uh, wonderful feeling to be a captain coach. You know, like, I mean, because when I retired, I went as a non-playing coach to North. And I was so bloody frustrated, I couldn't believe it. You know, like how anybody could, could well, be a coach. Well, wouldn't you be a bit frustrated at North anyway? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I got everything I deserved. But <laughs> I had a wonderful time at, at North. We, we did well. We, we had, had some good players. We had John Gray and you know, Timmy Pickup. We had some, and Brucey Walker and, and Rossi Warner. They, we had some excellent players there. And uh, but they had a lot of, the team had a lot of bad habits. You know, they... They could find a, a, a way to lose. You know, real good teams always just seem to win in the last bit, but North wouldn't matter if you were down by a point in the last half a minute, you'd get beat, you know. Like, Let's talk about good. your TV career. Oh, yeah. yeah that was well, interesting, wasn't it? Well, ta yeah. Talking to you now, you, you can totally see why they, they Rex got hold of you. Well, do you think there's more spite and violence in the game now? Well, I, I think this. I think that, yeah, th in different ways. I've always mm. advocated a punch in the nose never hurt anyone. But I'll tell you what. Didn't this, do any good. This elbow, what about yourself? <laughs> Rex Mossop was probably probably the most, under, uh, well, well, not underrated, but probably people looked at Rex the wrong way, I reckon, you know, because he's, Rex had an air about him, you know, and he did have an air about him. And when he stood up and was counted, you know, he, he was someone, you know. Oh, but yeah. When you sit down and think about it, Rex Mock was, as a footballer, he represented rugby union for, for Australia. He played rugby league for Australia. He played for the Kangaroos in the uh, vice captain in 1959. And when the England, when the Poms were at their top, he held down a spot with Lee. In uh, in England, you know, and I mean, and ran his show for twenty five years. Like I mean, not not a bad not a bad uh, rap for someone you can bang, you know. Yeah. But I used to bang him myself. You, you know, did, but, yeah. Oh, yeah. give it to. But he was your teammate, I guess. You, oh you yeah, we were him. roomies in nineteen fifty you know, in nineteen sixty World Cup. You know. What and was I, he like as a roomie? I, oh, couldn't, he was I good, wouldn't yeah. imagine sharing a room with Rex Moss. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, well, he got plenty back, I can tell you. Yeah, you know. I bet he did. We ended up square. <laughs> <laughs> now you're on the panel with Cole Pierce. He used to send Cole. you off all the time when you played. Yeah, yeah, but he was he he was nice to me when he did it. <laughs> you and Ian Walsh were great opponents at state level and great mates on tour, and you even looked a little bit alike. And that led to one of the best tricks ever played on one of you during an actual match. Tell us that story. When we when we were on the field, some referees used to call him Kelly and me Walsh. You know. So we were playing Wakefield Trinity one day and uh, anyway, the referee kept calling him Kelly and like he was going to send him off. He, there's no doubt he was dirty on Kelly. So, he, so I'm on the prop and he went, everything's going along and he's saying, get your feet back, Kelly, and all this. And, and while she's saying to him, I'm not Kelly. I said, oh, shut up, get on with it, you know, anyway, it's going along. So with that, this guy comes through the scrum and whacks Abdul, you know. So, oh, you mongrel, but I couldn't get at him, see. So anyway, the, the next scrum comes down. I flogged him. I hit him right on the whiskers, you know, this this guy that I squared it up otherwise. And the linesman come running in and he, and he said to Abdul, and he said to the referee, it's Kelly. It's Kelly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anyway, see, so he's saying, it's Kelly, sir. And uh, next minute, the referee's saying to Abdul, Kelly, get off. 
get off, Kelly. And Abdul saying, I'm not Kelly, that's Kelly. I said, come on, Ned, get off. <laughs> <laughs> and Abdul, anyway, the poor old Abdul had to go off. He went sent, off, he just walked <laughs> off, did he? God sent him off, yeah. As Ned Kelly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Ned, state of origin's everything these days. You got to play for Queensland and you got to beat New South Wales. Describe what it was like pre-state of origin. Well, it was just as good, to yep. be honest. It, it wasn't as far as the crowd was concerned. But, mate, uh, the feeling between the two teams was exactly the same, you know. And uh, in 1959 when we, we took to them, you know, we, we got stuck right into uh, New South Wales and... It was at the uh, exhibition ground in uh, Brisbane, and uh, so for intensity, oh, oh it was oh, it, it was intense. the equal, of, yeah, yeah, really. oh yeah. But I suppose thirty thousand people there, mm. you know, and I mean there wasn't anywhere near the people at home watching it on the telly or anything like that. Mm. But I mean, you had to go to the game to see it. So what was that feeling it, like when you? Oh, it was yourself? fantastic. Yeah. You, you couldn't hear yourself on the field, and you know, mm. people people liked that, and they. You know what, the Queenslanders were exactly the same then as they are now. Yeah. They were a bit partial let, let, letting a can go and all that stuff. <laughs> Is you know? that right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No problem at all. When you were playing for Wests, were you just a footballer or did you have to do other stuff as well? I was working three jobs, you know, and playing for Wests and we, just to get some money to get a deposit on our house, you know. So, um, and that was all along the salt water. I used to drive... Drive the ghost straight and they knock them down stalled on the Manly Pier. Sundays and then we you did, play, didn't you? play yeah. Sundays, yeah. Yep. All that. You the know. amusement pier at Manly. Yeah. yeah. Bounce at the Narrabeen pub. Oh, jeez. <laughs> One year where I was working for a, a great bloke called uh, Mick Wood and that was Annie's son, Max, at Military Road Mossman. And uh, we were playing the Poms in, uh, I think it was a third test, at the uh, cricket ground and Chris would come outside that I'd been at work since half past five in the morning and then we'd work, serve it in the shop and all the rest that we have to do as butchers. And then about one o'clock, Chris would pick me up out the front of the shop and we with the kids and we'd go to the cricket ground. Are you and, serious? And yeah. you're going to play for Australia? And, yeah. And Chris would, so I could buy a sausage off yeah. the Australian hooker yeah. in the morning and yeah. then go... Yeah. Are you joking? Yeah, if you had a hang on till about five o'clock, I've really barbecued it for you. <laughs> <laughs> and done a good job, yeah, too, I done reckon. A good, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. That's, that's right. Chris has picked me up at the front door of the thing, uh, we, at the shop. We go straight to the cricket ground and um, uh, she'd go up in the noble stand with the kids and the, and the other yeah. wives yeah. and I'd go up and have a lie down in the dressing room. In 61, 2 and 3, we played heaps of games at the cricket ground. They had the match of the day in those days. And, of course, the best sides were, were, were St George and us. And we, whoever we were playing were normally the, the game at the cricket ground about Saturday afternoon. And then we all go, go to the cricket ground and then as soon as the game was over, the gates had come out and all the mob from Newtown and anybody, the players around the joint, all into the bottom of the noble stand, you know. And we'd be in there until they pulled, kicked us out and all the have all our bags just chucked over in the corner. Wives are all in there talking and, and unbelievable. It was, just, it was just beautiful, you know. And of course, when you say did I, that changed our lives, it did, yeah, of course it did. Ned, it's been a privilege and a lot of fun to listen yeah. to these stories. Thanks for being part <laughs> of League Legends. <laughs> oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. No there we go. Now, listen. Now, there we go. Now, yeah, yeah, two has been sent up. Kelly is walking up. He's up there. This has been a Fox League production.